As crises and conflicts are deepening all around the world, there is an increasing need for humanitarian assistance. How can we help vulnerable communities? How can we support them to be stronger, more resilient? This is Voices for Resilience, the podcast of the Netherlands Red Cross. In this series, we will answer some of these pressing questions. What can we do to help underserved vulnerable communities to fight pneumonia when knowledge and resources are limited? Hi, I'm Libertad González. I'm in charge of public health projects at the Netherlands Red Cross. And in this episode, with the help of my colleagues, Lotte, Salam, and Gloria, we will tell you our story of how we managed to tackle high levels of pneumonia in five African countries and to save the lives of young children. The global fight against pneumonia has been ongoing for decades. Pneumonia is a deadly disease that can kill more young children than all of the other child illnesses we know, including malaria, diarrhea, and measles. More than 700,000 young children under the age of five years die every year from pneumonia. Governments, NGOs, international organizations like the Red Cross, and even UN agencies like the World Health Organization are doing their best to find a way to alleviate this situation. Although there has been improvement with some promising results, there are still regions in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where the mortality rate is still very high. For me, the most shocking thing about pneumonia is that it can be easily prevented. When a child is vaccinated, is breastfed in the first months of life and lives in a ventilated, dry and warm environment, the risk of having pneumonia reduces enormously. And even when children develop the disease, there is treatment. If the sick child would be taken to a health clinic where he or she is properly diagnosed and treated, the child could be promptly cured. So why are not children vaccinated? Why are not they breastfed by their mothers? Why don't parents or caretakers take their sick children to see a doctor when they show symptoms of pneumonia? Or if they go, why is it often too late? Together with the 3FM radio station in the Netherlands, we ran a fundraising campaign in 2015, just before Christmas. We asked the radio listeners to help us to answer these questions and implement solutions to fight pneumonia in five countries in Africa. Thanks to the dedicated audience, we managed to raise more than 9 million euros with this support, we funded projects in Mali, in Ivory Coast, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, and Zambia for four years. So we had the resources now, but we also needed a good working method. We knew from the beginning that people's behavior played a significant role in the development of pneumonia. So if we could influence the parents or caretakers' behavior, help them to make right decisions, changing some of their current habits and adopt new practices, we would be on the right track. Finding the right method to change behavior was definitely a necessary step. So now I propose you to Google the term changing health behavior. You get hundreds of thousands of hits. There are a lot of amazing and promising approaches for promoting community health action. But which one is the best? In our view, the best method definitely builds on science and evidence, yes, but also it is easy to adapt and it is easy to implement, which was very important for us since our work relies on community volunteers. With this in mind, we took elements from different behavior change communication methods and we created a simple step-by-step -step process. Before I tell you more on how we apply this process, my colleague, Lotte Huberger, who is in charge of monitoring, evaluation and learning in the Netherlands Red Cross, can give you some insights about the communities we worked with. They have close social connections. They are being proud of their own community and being active in keeping the community alive. They usually are quite often live in big families. So they live most of the time together with grandparents and then different brothers and sisters and all the children. 
which also means that it's not just one person taking care of the children, but it's the whole family. And in some cases, even the whole community. So they look after each other, which is beautiful. It was important for us to understand the different context, to get to know people we would be supporting about their everyday life, about their struggles, how parents and caretakers behave in a certain way. We wanted, most of all, to understand what motivates them, what obstacles they face. So in order to gain these valuable insights, first, we did extensive research. So we conducted hundreds of interviews. We had group discussions and group meetings. Through these conversations, we started to see common problems affecting families with sick children. We were able to understand what drives or stop a mother or caretaker when a child is sick and needs specialized health care. The results were very rich and interesting. For example, the health facility can be simply too far from the community or traveling would require hours of walking with your sick child or spending even good money in transport. So family dynamics can also play an important role. The mother or female caretaker is perhaps not allowed to travel alone with the child or requires permission from a senior family member like the mother-in-law, all that delaying the seeking of care. We noticed that mothers and caretakers did not have proper knowledge about pneumonia. Many of them were not aware of the danger of signs. If a child has high fever or fast, difficult breathing or bad coughing, they need to take urgent action and seek medical care as soon as possible. My colleague, Selam Seje, in charge of health projects in Ethiopia, can explain more about how families perceive pneumonia and what barriers exist for taking urgent action. It has a local name, a local definition, and often is associated with body spirit, and therefore the first Treatment is not really to go to the health facility, but to look for local remedies from the traditional healers or spiritual healers. But pneumonia can be treated. And with simple medication, you can actually save life. One experience that I encountered in, in Somali region where when I visited a household, a mom of five explained to me how she lost a child. When the child developed difficulty of breathing, she was advised by her mother-in-law, whom she really highly respects. She was clearly told, don't even bother taking the child to the health facility because this is, we know what this is. And we have had this experience. This is how we dealt for the last hundred of years. Our ancestors did it this way. So she actually followed the advice from the senior member of the family so she took that child to a traditional healer who burnt the chest of the child with hot metal. This child was only seven months old. That treatment only made the situation worse. And after one week, she lost her baby. Then she told me when the Red Cross came and explained what it was, It occurred to her, actually, her child died of pneumonia, not the bad spirit that was explained by her mother-in-law. So she's quite happy in one hand that the Red Cross came to explain these things to her community in her village, to herself and her peers who are young mothers, so that other children don't suffer the same fate. But she regrets that if she had had this information before she lost her baby, her baby would still be alive. Gloria Kunienga, who is in charge of health projects in Zambia, has a similar experience to share. When we were implementing this pneumonia project in Zambia, there was a mother who brought a child who had pneumonia, and this child had been sick for a number of days. And then when they went to the traditional healer, they were given some medication there, the traditional medicine, and this child never got better. There was a meeting which was taking place at the health facility. When they reached the health facility, the nurse looked at the child and checked and found that the child was already dead by the time they just arrived at the clinic. The nurse indicated to say, if you brought this child like maybe some few hours ago, or maybe if you brought the child yesterday, this child could have been saved. 
here in Africa and especially in Zambia, the main challenge that women face with children that have pneumonia is that there isn't enough knowledge uh, for mothers to understand or be able to identify that when the child has these signs and symptoms, it is pneumonia and I have to rush to the hospital. Maybe they haven't even heard about the disease before. The first thing that comes into their mind, the child has been bewitched. So the solution for witchcraft is to go to the traditional healer. They are really influential in the communities. They are well trusted because they are providing the treatment that people require. But sometimes they are just doing it for money. They're mixing soil with some leaves or sometimes it's maybe blood from animals. They just mix a lot of things. They can even pierce on the skin and put something in there. So this child is protected from witchcraft. Something that really will make the mother believe, yes, I think my child is now protected and has received the medication, is going to be fine. But at the end of the day, they go back home, the child gets worse and maybe they end up losing the child. Having completed our research and having a much deeper understanding on the people's behavior, the next major step in our process was setting up our communication strategy. In the examples explained by Salam and Gloria, we can see that if we want to achieve change, it is not just the mother or caretaker that we have to work with. We had to focus on the influencers of the community too. So we organized meetings where all of the key or influential people were present, from husbands and mothers-in-law to the traditional healers or even village chiefs. Gloria can tell us more about how a local team in Zambia engaged with traditional healers. So the first thing that this project did was to convince these traditional healers. There were frequent meetings with them to discuss about the problem in the community, the pneumonia itself, how it starts, how it spread, and what are the danger signs. They just need information. They just need the education. If the traditional healer himself is convinced, if it's coming from uh, the person who said it, that this is witchcraft, and this person is now coming back and tell them that, no, what I was telling you is wrong. I've learned myself that this problem is coming in because of the bacteria. That's why your child had this disease. So once the, the traditional healers understood how pneumonia is spread, it became very easy for them to start spreading the message to the mothers. Having all those actors aligned under the same work plan, that's the way we could all agree in the route to take. Volunteers and project staff started implementation of communication activities using a great variety of communication channels. Lotte can introduce you to some of the very interesting communication methods from the country projects. In different countries, there were different communication approaches. There was theater plays, dancing, music. In some countries, they developed songs specifically for this project. So if, for instance, in Mali, there was like a caravan approach and they would really go from village to village. They would show videos, do dances. One method that worked really well in Ethiopia was a theater group. So people playing different characters. Sometimes you get different teams, like one is really opposing and one is really in favor. They usually start clapping, yelling. What I also really liked was sometimes they ask the audience to participate, taking people into that story. So they really ask like an, an elderly man, for instance, would you join this play and maybe play a mother? And what would you do? What kind of dilemmas do you see? And how are different relations in the family and how they affect how we approach pneumonia and how we approach healthcare? And what do you do as a father? So that creates a very nice of interactive scene that makes the people watching even more engaged because then it's their own <laughs> peers, basically, that are playing. Even the stories were usually quite sad, but still the events were usually quite happy and lively and positive. Really like a can-do mentality of, okay, we can make a change together. Okay, I want to be part of this. I want to make a change myself for myself, my family, my community. That was really nice to see. Since in a lot of communities, the fathers are making the decisions related to health-seeking behavior, we needed methods that would be effective and acceptable for this group too. Lotte will explain more about the husband's school in Mali. 
in the communities where we work in Mali, the fathers are usually the ones making the decision. So they decide whether you will take your baby to a hospital, whether there will be money set aside to do this. That's why it came out that it was very important to also involve the fathers and take them along in the story. Usually what really helps to engage the fathers is positive examples from their own community and influential people, an elderly in the community or a chief in the community that say, yeah, actually it would be good to join this group and go to this father's group. But yeah, I will go there and I will ask my sons to go there. And then that usually has a good effect on the others and then they will all go. And they drink tea and they also have a good time together and they discuss and they're among peers. I can't stress it enough how important Red Cross volunteers are for our work. Our method was absolutely designed to utilize their strengths and amplify their impact on people's behavior. Salam has a lot of experience working with our volunteers and can speak more to this. They come from the same community we are serving. They are knowledgeable. They understand the social norms, the culture, the values. And once you train them and provide them with the necessary skills and knowledge and understanding, they can translate the knowledge to the community where they come from and then accompany them through the journey. They do home visits, explaining the preventive measures that the mom need to adopt and practice. Because they come from the same community, they really, really support the communities to adopt and sustain that behavior. When you work with volunteers, they are the best, let's say, ambassador in terms of them presenting what the Red Cross is really doing to the community and vice versa. They also see the impact of the work we are doing there and what motivates them is that gain, that internal reward to see a better community where they are residing. Their satisfaction comes from serving the community and then therefore they are highly committed. The community also trusts them because they are one of them. If you see the final numbers, our pneumonia program was a success. We managed to directly reach more than 100,000 people and indirectly more than 300,000 people in the four countries. In Ivory Coast, for example, we saw 54% increase in parents recognizing at least three symptoms of pneumonia. Or in Sudan, there was a 43% decrease in the reported use of traditional treatment for sick children. Our success had different ingredients, but I think the most important factor was the involvement of the community. The conversations we had with the communities deepened our understanding of the context and increased people's trust in our process. It enabled us to develop solutions together. Being part of the process, community members were much more engaged and interested. They shared lots of information with us and participated in the design and planning of the communication strategy. We involved them, took their questions, listened their opinions and used this feedback to fine tune the strategy, which resulted in a much higher acceptance and a higher impact. Involving the community came with another benefit too. Salam has seen the direct effect of involving mothers in our work. They take it upon themselves to even challenge their own community members because they have seen their ideas were hard. They are being part of the solution. We identified the problem together and you see them having that social influence on the people who are not adopting the behavior. Look, you know, now we know the importance of breastfeeding. Why are you not doing it? Oh, but you know, that's for the Red Cross. No, 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 no. It's not just the Red Cross. They take ownership. They feel confident. They are involved. They are in charge. And they sustain it. They continue to do the positive behavior even after the project. Looking at the knowledge, experience, and insights we gained from the project, we can give an answer to the question we asked in the beginning of the podcast. 
What can we do to build resilience? What can the Netherlands Red Cross contribute? We can make communities stronger by giving them the means, but we can only provide them part of the means usually because we cannot change the whole economic system. But we can make people sort of knowledgeable and active community members. We can bring community structures, how people can connect to each other. And in that way, they can also ask each other for help. So when a crisis hits, they can manage to come back to really to bounce back. And I think that's really a sign that the community is strong. This is the aim of our work. This is our hope. So my hopes are for these communities that we have made a lasting change. So that the people that were involved in the project, they will remember what they learned, what was done, and take that with them for hopefully the rest of their lives. And maybe also teach their children what they learned, bringing it to the next generation. Communities affected by high cases of pneumonia pay a high toll in loss of life, disability and suffering. If the community develops a strong protective behavior against pneumonia, they can deal in general crisis situations much better, whether it is pneumonia, other diseases or even a natural disaster. If you want to know more about our behavior change communication methods, I recommend you to watch our video in the website www.communityengagementhub.org. That's it for today. It was Voice for Resilience, the podcast of the Netherlands Red Cross. My name is Libertad González. It's been a really pleasure sharing this story with you. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for the next episode.